arc length and curvature. The arc length of a smooth curve C, which is defined by the vector function R of T is equal to uh, X of T, Y of T, Z of T on an interval A less than or equal to T, less than or equal to B, which only which means that it only traces this curve one time is given by S is equal to the integral from A to B of the square root of the sum of the component function derivatives squared, which you can write concisely as the integral from A to B of the magnitude of the derivative of the vector function R. So note that this formula also applies to functions in two space. It's a different version of it than we've seen before, but we've actually seen this, uh, this formula before. So as an example, let's take a look at a vector function defined by cosine of t as the x component, sine of t as the y component, and negative t plus 100 as the z component. Uh, we want to let this, uh, we're interested in the arc uh, from 0 to 2 pi, letting t range over that interval. And this represents the trajectory uh, of the descent of a hang glider. So how far will the glider travel along the path? So. We set up our arc length calculation, and we're going to note that, that as s. s is equal to the integral from 0 to 2 pi of the square root of the derivative of each of the component functions squared. And I definitely left dt off of all of these. So I'll add it now. So the derivative of cosine of t for our x component is going to lead us to negative sine of t. And the second line, the derivative of sine of t is cosine of t, and the derivative of negative t is negative 1. So that takes us to the second line of work here. Now, negative sine squared is positive sine squared. Uh, cosine of t squared is cosine of t squared. And negative 1 squared is positive 1. Now, we should hopefully recognize sine squared plus cosine squared, as long as the inputs match. That's the Pythagorean theorem applied to uh, the unit circle, that gives us one. And so what we have underneath that square root is uh, the integral of root two with respect to t. And so that's gonna give us root two t evaluated from t is equal to zero to t is equal to two pi. And that will result as two pi root two. We can extend the idea of arc length into a function that takes t as its input and returns the related arc length of our vector value function r on the input interval 0 to t as defining it to be the definite integral from 0 to t. s of t is an indefinite integral from 0 to t. And the only thing we've done here is we've changed t to u um, as the variable of integration, it's kind of a dummy variable. It, it could be any variable you want it to be. It, it doesn't really matter because we're going to plug in that t value at the end. So for instance, if we did this with our prior example, we would integrate s as normal. We'd get the same result we did. We got a root 2 du. Now notice we've changed to, we put t as the upper limit of the integration. And so our dummy variable for integration is du. And so integrating root two with respect to u gives us root two times u. We're gonna evaluate that for, I'm gonna go ahead and change this. I'm gonna say, okay, u is equal to zero and u is equal to t. Um, right now that might seem like overkill, overkill rather, but in, as we move on, you might see that it's actually really helpful to label these things with respect to what variable you're plugging in for. And so doing that real quick, we end up with s of t is equal to root two of t. In other words, for the descent like arc length of our hang glider here, uh, as long as we're starting at time equals zero, we can find the arc length at any point in time from zero. And I'm using the word time here uh, kind of informally, um, is given by s of t is equal to root two times t. The reason I say I'm using the word time here informally is, is, is we can think of t as time, but it doesn't always represent time. So, Another thing we can do with arc length is to reparameterize a curve in terms of distance rather than time t. So since we have a way to calculate a function that returns arc length, s of t, we can exploit this relationship to reparameterize a curve with arc length s as the input. 
doing this, what it gives us is an increase in one unit of input is equal to the output being one unit of distance, arc length, away from the starting point. So taking a look at the two graphs we have below, the left-hand graph shows a, a function r of t, a vector valued function, that as you plug t in, um, because you can think of time equals t, think of t as time, and as you travel from t equals zero to t equals one, you travel a, a shorter amount of distance. And as you notice, as you go from t equals one to t equals two, you, you travel a longer amount of distance. So it appears that this particle traveling along this path with respect to time is traveling at different speeds, if you will. Uh, it's going a little faster between t equals one uh, than it is between t equals zero and t equals one between. So if you reparameterize this thing, you can uh, then you have a function that takes uh, distance as its input, and you can say, hey, from the starting distance, I want to know what point on the curve is exactly one unit of, of distance away from the starting point. At, so plugging an S of one would give us that. How, what point is exactly two units of distance away from the starting point S of zero, uh, S equals zero, and plugging in S equals two will give us that, and you can kind of see those points on the graph there. So let's continue our example about the hang glider. We know s of t equals root two times t. Solving for t, we can get s over root two is equal to t. I'm just taking this and, and just sort of uh, as, you know, sometimes we drop the, you could think of y of x equals x squared as the same thing as y is x, y is equal to x squared. We're just dropping the input and saying, okay, s over root two is equal to t is the same thing as s equals root two times t. Then we can reparameterize the descent path this way. Well, the original function took t as an input and now t of s, well that we have over here, now t of s is equal to s over root two. And so we can plug in for that and say, okay, we get cosine of s over root two, sine of s over root two, and then for the z component, negative s over root two plus 100. Notice that when we have t is equal to zero, s is also zero. We have an initial point r of zero is equal to one, zero, 100. If we wish to find the point on the descent path that is 25 units of distance away from that initial point, we can just plug in uh, 25 to our newly parametrized version of, of the uh, vector function r and get r of 25 is equal to cosine of 25 over root two, et cetera. And we get that the point is 0.39, negative 0.92, and 82.83 will be along the descent path of this hang glider, a distance of 25 units away from the initial point. All right, so the next concept is curvature. So let t represent a unit tangent function or uh, unit tangent vector to a curve r of t as we move along the curve the direction of t will change and so just take a look at that graph down there at the bottom there uh, as we're progressing and following these ar arrows just starting with the first one my unit tangent vector is pointing kind of what looks to be up at about uh, three pi over four angle but then as it's approaching point a the unit tangent vector starts to point at close to a pi angle. And then as we progress past A and, and further along the trajectory, uh, it seems like it's approaching something like 60 degrees or pi over three. So curvature measures the rate of change of the direction of T, how quickly T is quote turning. Uh, so if you have a larve curvature, a large curvature, that means T is turning rapidly. An example of this would be at point A. It's uh, It goes from sort of pointing to the west to pointing to the northeast uh, fairly quickly. Whereas if you have small curvature, the unit tangent vector is not turning very rapidly. And point B would be an example of this. Yeah, it's turning, but it's not turning anywhere nearly as rapidly as at point A. So here's the definition. Let t be a unit tangent vector, uh, and it's a unit tangent vector to a smooth curve r. And the fact that it's smooth just guarantees we don't have any nasty sharp corners or cusps. Uh, then the curvature function of the curve of, is given by 
kappa is equal to the magnitude of the derivative of the unit tangent vector with respect to arc length. Uh, and you can also notate that as t primed with respect to s, the magnitude of that vector, where s is the arc length parameter. Now, it can be challenging to find this as it's written. So there are other versions of this formula that we use when we need to ca actually calculate curvature. So here are some curvature formulas in two space and three space. Uh, in any case, C is a smooth curve, whether it's in two space or three space. So in two space, uh, if C is defined as Y is equal to F of X, kind of what we're used to working with, uh, then Kappa is equal to the absolute value of the second derivative um, of F. And then all of that is divided by the quantity one plus the derivative squared uh, all raised to the three halves power. Uh, in the second instance for two space, if you have it not defined as y is equal to f of x, but rather you have your curve defined as a vector valued function, r of t, uh, with components x of t and y of t respectively, then kappa is equal to the absolute value of x primed y double primed minus x double primed y primed all over um, uh, this, the quantity x primed squared plus y prime squared all raised to the three halves power. Then in three space, you have C defined by a, our standard vector valued R, which is X, Y, and T component, X, Y, and Z component functions. And then kappa curvature is equal to the magnitude of T primed, the unit tangent vector function primed, uh, divided by the magnitude of our R, vector R function primed which if you manipulate, you can get that is equal to the cross product of the first derivative of R with the second derivative of R, take the magnitude of that and divide it by the magnitude of R primed all raised to the third power. So those are some formulas we can use to actually calculate curvature. So let's take an example of it. So we're gonna compare the curvature of a parabola in the plane at Y equals X squared. Um, we wanna compare it at the vertex X equals zero and at the point x equals one. So now we're gonna use the version of the formula since we have y is equal to f of x, we're gonna use that version of the formula. So kappa is equal to f double, absolute value of f double primed, all divided by that expression, which is really hard to say out loud. So I'm just gonna let you read it. So doing this, the second derivative of x squared is two, because the first derivative is two X and the derivative of two X is just two. So on top we have absolute value of two, which is just two. And the denominator, what do we need? We need the derivative. So that's two X squared. That's gonna give us inside the parentheses that are raised to the three halves power, that's gonna give us one plus four X squared. So now we wanna know, um, okay, so I know that this thing is, is not a, vector valued function, but let's just pretend my picture is, is okay. Instead of using vectors, we should really have uh, tangent lines here. And so at X equals zero, we have curvature K equals two, because plugging in X in the denominator, you would get two over one plus zero and one raised to any power, even three halves is just one. So it's just two. Now plugging in X equals to one, we see that you get curvature is equal to 0 0.18. Now looking at this uh, graph, let's fix it. There we go, fixed. Okay, and then just disregard these and think of that as the tangent line instead of the tangent vector. Um, you could see that if you were to look at a tangent, I'm okay with it. It may not be perfect, but I'm okay with it. Uh, you can see that if we were to compare these two, the rate of change of that tangent vector, if you will, well, at the vertex, well, it's changing pretty quickly. It's it's going from here to here to here to here. It's changing pretty quickly. It's 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 turning fairly quickly. So you get a fairly large curvature of two. Whereas when we look at it at x equals to one, well, it's in this direction, and then and then as we progress, it's turning, but it's not turning anywhere nearly as much. So it should have a smaller curvature. So everything on that slide was okay, except for my T's off to the left. And uh, the picture is reasonable. 
that's not perfect. So let's figure out what the curvature of a circle is. Well, if, if you think about what curvature means, we've got ourselves a circle. And if you look at the unit tangent vector at any point, it doesn't feel like it's changing. Uh, the rate of change of this turn uh, of, of the rate of change of the unit tangent vector is, is, doesn't appear to be changing. It appears to be a constant rate of change. And so as, as such, our curvature should be constant as well. So we've got a circle, which is in two space, and it's defined with a vector value function. So we'll use this version of the curvature formulas. And so x is r cosine of t, just plugging in and working our way through the algebra. x is r cosine of t, x is r cosine of t. Well, let's keep going with x's. Here we go. And then y is r sine of t, y is r sine of t. So we get this, do the math on that stuff, tidy it up as you go, and you end up with one over r. And so since the radius of a circle, any given circle is fixed, uh, the curvature of one over r is fixed as well. And we can see that the curvature of a circle is constant. So now let's talk about normal and binomial vectors. So again, let C be a smooth curve in three space parameterized by our vector function r. Then the unit tangent vector that we've seen before at any point in time t is given by vector t of t is equal to uh, vector r primed scaled by down to unit vector by scaling it by its own length. And what this tells us is the unit tangent vector tells us about the forward motion of the particle along the curve. And if we think back to one of those applets that we've seen, uh, we, we watched a vector valued function generating a tangent uh, vector. And as it moved around the curve, the tangent vector was always kind of pointing in the direction of travel. So the unit normal vector at a, point, a given input of t is represented by vector n of t, which is um, the derivative of the unit tangent vector scaled by its own length again. We're scaling by their own length just to make these things unit here. Um, one important thing to note is that the normal vector, as normal suggests, is going to be orthogonal to the tangent vector. And it tells us about the direction that the curve is turning. And the next one of these vectors is the binormal vector. Uh, and it's given by vector b is equal to the cross product of the unit tangent vector and the unit normal vector. And the binormal vector is going to be orthogonal to both the unit tangent and the unit normal vectors. And it tells us about the twisting of the particle as it travels along the path. Together, all three of these vectors provide a useful frame of reference for kind of interpreting movement on our curve, which is sometimes called the TNB frame. So we'll load up this little example here. All right, so here is the applet kind of moving. And while the slider is currently going backwards, but now it's going forward. And as we're going forward, we can kind of see that, hey, T points in the direction of travel, N points and it tells us which direction we're turning. And B kind of gives us an idea of how the curve is twisting. It helps to kind of interpret the, the movement of a particle along our curve in space. All right, so an example, let's do an example here. Let's find normal and binomial vectors. Uh, well, let's find all of them. Let's find the tangents as well. So let r of t be three cosine of t, three sine of t, four of t, four t. So first the unit tangent vector, uh, and we know that that's the derivative of the, the original function scaled down to one by dividing or multiplying by one over its own magnitude. So first the derivative of the r vector r function is negative three sine of t, derivative of the x component, uh, derivative of y as three sine of t has derivative three cosine of t and derivative of four t is four. Now we calculate the length of the magnitude of this vector. And as we square the component, the component terms, we get nine sine squared plus nine cosine squared plus four squared. Um, 
you can factor out a nine to get nine times sine squared plus cosine squared of t. And that is gonna be one times nine. And so you get nine plus 16 and that gives us five under, uh, yeah, that gives square root of 25, which gives us five. So scaling down our tangent vector down to unit length, we have negative three fifths sine of t, three fifths cosine of t and four fifths. Now that we know t, we can calculate the normal vector, n. Uh, and as the formula shows, the normal vector n is given by the derivative of the tangent vector scaled down to unit length. So the tangent vector is shown there. And so the derivative of the tangent vector is gonna be negative 3 fifths cosine of t, negative 3 fifths sine of t, and zero for the z component finally. Now we calculate the length of that. Um, which is gonna be the square root of those components squared, which leads us to a, a magnitude of 3 fifths. Whoops. And so, what happened? Hmm. I feel like there was a slide accident or the computer's hiccuping on me here. All right, so let's do this by hand so that we know what's happening here because the computer's throwing a glitch at me or I've messed up. That's probably it. So n, whoops, is equal to one over the magnitude of t primed, which is three fifths times t primed. And so that is five thirds times the vector negative uh, three fifths cosine, negative three fifths sine of t, comma zero. And then as we distribute that through, we see that, or scale it rather, we get five thirds times three fifths. Well, that's multiplying reciprocals. Everything reduces away nicely uh, for both the x and the y components to give us negative cosine of t, sine of t, zero. Okay, so now we have the tangent, the unit tangent, and the unit normal. And so now it's time to calculate the unit binormal. So we got our unit tangent, our unit normal, and then to find B, the binormal, we take the cross product of the tangent and the normal. So we've got the matrix set up, and then after quite a bit of finding the determinant of that matrix, we come to the conclusion that the binormal is given by negative four fifths sine of t for the x component, negative four fifths cosine of t for the y component, and three fifths cosine squared of t minus three fifths sine squared of t for the z component. All right, so that gives us all that information. Let's take a look at what exactly happens at a particular instance a uh, particular input. So we're gonna look at this at pi over two. So the position vector on our curve, R of t at pi over two, gives us zero, three, two pi. The unit tangent vector at that point is negative three fifths, zero, four fifths. The unit normal at that point is zero, one, zero. And the unit binormal is negative four fifths, zero, negative three fifths. And what we have here is here's a plot of the curve R in space with the unit tangent normal and binormal plotted all together on the same plot, which we can take a look at. Uh, maybe zoom in on a little bit, but I think it's actually pretty good the way it is on the slide. Yeah, so while we can zoom in a little bit, we've kind of lost the uh, lost the x and y plane. But if we were to zoom out, maybe we'd get it. I don't know. There we go. Yeah, I think it's actually better on the slide than in this little screen. So we're going to call it good there because that's, uh, that's it for arc length and curvature.